So good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us. I'm Ann Olazabel, the Interim Dean here at the Miami Herbert Business School. Very pleased to welcome you to the Future of Leadership series that we co-host here with McKinsey's Miami office. Um, this is Andre Dua, who's going to just introduce himself, and, uh, and then we'll have a conversation with Brent Burns. So welcome. <clears throat> Thanks, Ann. Um, it's good to see everyone again. Um, as folks, as some of you know, I recently came from New York. By recently, I mean nearly five years ago now. <laughs> and uh, actually, I was asking someone what I have to do to be considered a local. And uh, I've discovered what it is. It's when you go to lunch and they ask you, would you like to order a coffee? You say, I'd like to have a cortadito, please. <laughs> and that officially makes you more Miami than asking for a macchiato. So officially, <laughs> I'm from Miami now. Well, listen, I'm excited to be he sitting here with Brent Burns. Brent is the president and CEO of JM Family Enterprise. It's a privately held company with revenue now over $20 billion, 20, 21 almost billion. Almost 21 billion this year. Well over yeah. 5,000 associates. And it grew from a core business focused on uh, Toyota dealerships into a much more diversified company. And Brent, I'll have you explain that uh, in a minute. But it covers things like vehicle distribution and processing, financial services, finance and insurance products, retail sales, dealer technology, and some franchises also, mm -hmm. uh, actually. And I believe last year it was ranked number 22 in the largest private businesses uh, in America. Um, in Florida, there are just a couple companies bigger, probably Publix and Southern Glazers. Yep. Um, so it's a very, very uh, interesting business. And maybe as we get started, you can tell us a little bit more about this wide-ranging business. Um, and maybe you could also say, just to put it in perspective, how many Toyotas did you sell last year? <laughs> just a little, uh, little short of 500,000. Um, literally in the U.S., um, one out of every four Toyotas is uh, sold through our 177, uh, uh, I, I say our, I, we are truly partners, but they are independent franchisee dealers, uh, 177 in the five southeast states. And then we, um, we sell about 50% of Toyota's fleet. So this year, uh, this past year, we did 120,000 fleet vehicles and uh, 350,000 um, uh, retail wholesales. So dealers sold uh, new vehicles. Amazing. So you've been at JM for 24 years now. You started as C CFO, if I'm not mistaken, uh, or maybe before that, but yeah. you were CFO in 2008, which maybe we can talk about just a little bit. Sure. Brought the company through some pretty tumultuous financial time, uh, times, uh, and then, you know, made your way to CEO. Tell us a little bit about that journey and maybe a little bit about that experience in 2008. Sure. So um, I'll start with how, how I got there. Um, uh, you know, life is um, built on relationships, and uh, my JM family journey actually began in the late 80s. Um, I was uh, at Alamo Rent-A-Car. I bought every Toyota they would sell me, um, and uh, so I got to know uh, Southeast Toyota really well um, while I was uh, uh, while I was there. Uh, then was part of the founding of AutoNation. Most people don't realize this, but AutoNation was actually gestated inside of JM Family, mm -hmm. and Jim Moran and Wayne Heisinger got together to launch it, um, and JM Family exited when they pivoted from a used car superstore that we didn't see as being competitive with our dealer base to a roll up of new car franchises, which was competitive. And so uh, AutoNation uh, uh, um, uh, or JM Family exited the AutoNation investment at, uh, at that point in time. So while I was at AutoNation, I worked with both the finance company, Southeast Toyota Finance, and with the insurance company, Jim Moran and Associates. Um, so, I hit the ground running. I actually, 2000, you have to, many of the students here probably weren't even born then, but we had this Y2K thing, and there was this <laughs> new thing called the internet, and we were trying to figure out um, how to make that work. So I actually started as the vice president of the Office of the Web, which, <laughs> uh, 
didn't last very long. I, I, I then wound up the, becoming kind of the interim uh, chief information officer for a short while, and then um, th this was all literally in the first 12 months of me being there, um, moved over and started running the finance company, uh, Southeast Toyota Finance. And then in 2008, um, Colin Brown, our CEO and now our chairman, uh, I had my dream job. I, I loved what I was doing, but I loved the company more. And he said, I need that Wall Street experience and uh, a firm hand to lead us through it. And so um, I, I moved into the CFO slot at the, uh, at the parent company uh, at that point in time. And, um, you know, for somebody that had grown up um, doing deals, it was like nothing I'd ever seen before. In a normal world, anything can get done. It's just a question of structure and price. Um, in 2008, there was just no bid. Um, it was incredible. I mean, Toyota was a AAA credit and they were rolling their commercial paper over every night because a AAA credit, even then, people didn't want to take risk any longer than they had to. So it was an unprecedented time um, and um, hopefully a once in a lifetime because I don't want to have to go through that again. But, uh, but it forced us to, to really look at ourselves and say, we want to have a fortress balance sheet. We don't want to be dependent upon the market. We want to make sure that we're properly capitalized and structured. Um, it also, I think, demonstrated what I think we learned it early, which is you don't have to be a public company to be fully capable of raising the capital and, and having the potential to grow. And I think that's kind of taken for granted now because private equity has become as ubiquitous as it is. And um, <clears throat> so the whole idea that you had to be a public company, and I've been in public companies before, um, you know, the trade-offs um, uh, to me um, aren't, aren't worth it. If, if you've got the ability to access uh, capital, um, there's a lot to be said for, uh, for being in the private markets and, and being able to lay out a long-term strategy and then execute against that strategy without having to chin to an every 90 day report card. Um, so um, sat in that role for, uh, for to 2014, then became the chief operating officer, then added president, and then in uh, 18 added uh, CEO uh, to, uh, uh, to the title. Um, so um, it's, uh, I couldn't be more proud to, to lead 5,000 uh, phenomenal associates and, uh, uh, and uh, uh, continue the trajectory and continue the work that Jim Moran started all those years ago. So, what a journey. Yeah, it's been great. Brent, can, can I pick up on that point? I'd like to go a little deeper on this issue of public versus private ownership because I think this is one of the big trends of the last kind of decade or two where private equity is owning more assets, um, where companies are going private, where there are perceived to be a lot of challenges related to being a publicly traded company. Uh, uh, so I'd love to get, you know, you've obviously seen many sides of this. What are your reflections on that? What do you think that means, you know, for the economy? Um. I think that the public world just forces a fair amount of short-termism. Mm -hmm. um, and um, now having said that, um, and we are a, as an insurance company, we have lots of float. We have a big balance sheet. We have a $30 billion balance sheet. We are big 
investors in private equity as both a limited partner as well as uh, co-investors with them on any number of deals. It's not perfect. Uh, you know, um, I actually, um, when we're looking to control invest, um, I love to recruit either the existing management or the founding families by saying, get off the treadmill. Uh, because the, you know, the beauty of private equity is it's a longer window than that 90 day window, but it is a window because those funds are limited in term and those investors, and I, I, you know, I'm, I'm bipolar on this because as an LP, I, you know, I want my IRR and I want my money back. Yeah. Um, with a return, um, but that inherently means that you're trying to transform incredibly quickly um, so that you can trade again. And um, um, as a private equity investor, you know, trading amongst themselves can sometimes hide a problem. Um, sometimes it makes sense to have it go from a middle market firm to, you know, a Blackstone or a right. KKR that's a bulge bracket firm that can take them to the, to the next level. So those growth oriented changes make sense to me, but it can also encourage bad behavior. I, you know, I got a bad... I got a dog in the portfolio. I'll take your dog if you take my dog. Right. Um, and uh, um, so there's, it's, it's not a perfect world, um, but I, I do believe that the sense of urgency is, is very real. The transformative nature of what they're trying to do is very real. And in many respects, the public market would have a harder time consuming and understanding the long-term nature of that transformation that's taking place, I think. So in some respects, I think being public forces you to be a little more incremental. Um, and it can be... Incremental because you can't get the same short-term performance bump. If you're doing a transformation, you need some time for it to play you out. You need time as well as how do you explain to the market? Yep. Um, you know, You've got to convince those analysts and, you know, and then the, the Me Too nature of whoever your coverage uh, cohort is, everybody has to do all the things that that cohort says that sector needs to, to have. So um, it homogenizes and um, almost punishes um, a, you know, a, a, a differentiated strategy in some respects. And, um, you know, and that's not a criticism on the coverage model because I think it, 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 it does a lot of good things and it holds management teams accountable, but it's, um, uh, it's clear uh, that you can raise the capital in the private markets uh, effectively and, and that's evolved, you know, I mean, we were, I was personally involved at Alamo and then uh, at, at JM Family. They were, they literally did the first lease securitization back in the 90s. And so you look at the maturity of those ABS markets. I mean, we, we go to market six to eight times a year um, and raise in any given year, you know, kind of six to $10 billion. Um, so, um, you know, supported by great Toyotas and great Toyota customers, uh, whether it be a retail installment contract or, uh, or a lease. So uh, no limitation there. We have a who's who, you know, uh, bank group that uh, is uh, always hopeful that we'll have more needs. Uh, and, uh, uh, and, and we're, um, and, and we know that they're there if, if we need them to be. Mm. So, you know, it does show you the efficiency of the markets, be they private or public. Right. Yeah. So you talked about innovation and speed and your ability to be more nimble, perhaps. Um, 
but you're also leading an impressive array of businesses under the JM family umbrella. Uh, let me just read off the list here for our audience. Not, a, not only is it Southeast Toyota Distributors, which you mentioned, but Southeast Toyota Finance, JM, JM and A Group, Home Franchise Concepts, Futura Title and Escrow, and more, right? How, how do you lead such a broad array of, of organizations um, and create a shared vision? It, um, well, if you listen to that, you might think I've got ADD, but uh, uh, <laughs> there is actually um, a core that ties all the pieces together, and, uh, um, and, and, and I do sometimes underestimate, I, Stephen Nessie, who was our long-term PwC partner, and I, most people don't know this, but even private companies, they have a rotation requirement at 10 years, and so he was having to rotate off, and it was like, Stephen, it's like six months, nine months, what, you know, how hard can it be to find a new partner? And, and he, it kind of hit, the point kind of hit me, he says, well, he says, you're a world-class distributor, you're a bank, you're an insurance company, and effectively, you're a private equity firm. Um, now, having grown up there and, and I've been part of the, the birthing of, of many of the elements of that. I, I didn't, never really thought of it in those terms, but I will come back to the core that undergirds all of that is our culture. Um, and then um, everything is built upon the culture and the associates that um, uh, really drive those businesses. And then I'll, I'll put them together because it all, it's all customer centric. So Southeast Toyota is the distributor. We are um, on contract from Toyota, the franchise or uh, technically Toyota is, but they've contracted to us as the distributor with, for those 177 dealers. Those dealers at one point in their past had a challenge financing their vehicles. And so we created Southeast Toyota Finance to um, be a finance company, but their role in life is to be a partner of both Southeast Toyota and our dealers so that capital and credit is never an inhibitor to either <coughs> the dealership or to their consumers. Um, and so hence, that piece of the puzzle. And then consumers said, I, you know, these vehicles are increasingly complex and expensive to repair, and I would like to have insurance products that would uh, address those concerns, whether it be a, an extended service contract, whether it be gap protection for uh, the difference between the payoff on the vehicle and the collateral value, whether it be road hazard tire, a whole host of uh, products that support that. So that suite is what we support and work in a B to B to C business model in the core of everything that we do. Now we have a transportation business. We'll do $800 million worth of part sales this year uh, in support of that business. It's, you know, it's a little niche that's bolted on to the fact that we're going to wholesale 360,000 vehicles, and if they can build them, we'll wholesale 400,000 vehicles, um, plus the, the fleet business. So that's the core of what we've got. We then, um, from a diversification perspective, said the culture will undergird everything that we do. We're already in the garage, the logical next step, that, so the, the vehicle is the second biggest purchase, the logical next place would be the home. And so home franchise concepts became kind of the linchpin. It sounds different. We are the franchisor. So you're going to buy Lennar so, next? <laughs> <laughs> you see the theme there, though, is we're in the business of empowering those right. franchisees to serve their customer base. Um, and, uh, and so those diversified acquisitions were really driven off of that core culture that undergirds everything uh, and then laying on top of it. Futura Title and Escrow, a business that we acquired uh, recently, everything that Futura and Title 
uh, title and escrow does in the home purchase is done in the finance and insurance office of a dealership. It's the same product, it's just a different product that is part of that transactional process. Um, it's high frequency, low severity insurance products. We know and understand that. It's a culture that undergirds everything that we do, so it's, it's really tightly connected. Um, we added national truck protection, uh, which is essentially we're really good at um, the class one vehicle side of the equation. National truck protection does all the things that Jim Moran and Associates does, except they do it in the class two through eight trucking side, primarily in class eight independent uh, trucking uh, operators. So <clears throat> it sounds really diverse, but they're, we're leveraging the culture and the core competencies that we've got for a different product or a different industry. Makes sense now. Very comfortable for us. Okay, so um, Brent has mentioned culture a few times. Um, and one of the things I think that's really interesting is, you know, obviously the name of the company is JM Family, but maybe it's worth going back a little in history to just explain, does it, who knows what the JM stands for? Jim Moran, right. So, you know, we had the opportunity to talk a little bit before. This is a true legend in the automotive industry. And I'm going to ask Brent in a moment how that influences this company to this day. But just to give a sense, before he started JM Family Enterprises, which started with the Southeast uh, Toyota dealerships, first he had the biggest Hudson brand dealership in America. That became, in the end, the biggest Ford dealership in America. And eventually, um, he moved to Florida after getting cancer and starting or getting the biggest Pontiac dealership in America. So that by the time JM started, there was really this already this history and this legacy. Um, but uh, I, what I wanted to ask you, Brent, is what legacy did Jim leave for the company and how does that still influence the company? And in a way, what's it like to follow a legend like that? Because there's this incredible endowment that he's left the company in a way that clearly still influences the culture. Yeah, I, I, I mean, every day I, I always try to hold myself to uh, a, a standard that says would he, and I, I had the good fortune of being able to work directly with Mr. Moran and uh, uh, to, to learn from him and, and um, hold myself to that standard of, um, is this the way that he would do it and would he be proud of it? And you, you, you mentioned that JM. There were a handful of times that I brought an idea um, that at the time uh, probably seemed uh, a little crazy. Um, and uh, he would say to me, if your name was on the building, would you do that? And so uh, don't do anything that you wouldn't, uh, that you wouldn't be proud of. Um, and uh, and I use that same line with my 30-something-year-old uh, children that, um, about their life and their career. You know, be proud of everything that you do um, and uh, uh, take ownership of, uh, of everything that you do. Um, I think he would be incredibly proud of the company that we continue to grow and be because we have um, undergirded everything that we do with those cultural principles that uh, that he taught us and um, he just had an incredible I, I always say that most people believe that life is an either-or situation you can do this or you can do that he lived life in a both-and mode and, uh, and and that culture is the convergence of um, what you do and how you do it. I was telling these guys earlier today, it's like the difference between swimming and diving. And diving, it's the physical part of it, but there's also the style points that you get. And we believe that that cultural side of things, that you are uh, embracing uh, the culture that we're all about is, is critical and it creates that 
synergy and that cohesiveness that allows a team that may not have the best athletes to collectively achieve more than anybody else. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll use a sports metaphor. I'm a FAU grad. March Madness is always a great example. If you took the individual rankings of FAU's men's basketball team that wound up being number two last year, I'm sure they would have been in the bottom 50 of the 100 teams that were there, and yet they collectively created something that was greater than the sum of the parts. And we believe that culture allows us to do that. And strategy is important, execution is important, but culture eats all of those things for lunch. And um, you know what you can expect and depend upon from your teammates. And um, um, so, uh, you know, I, I, I think that's just an incredibly important piece of the puzzle. Great. Yeah. So I'm interested in, in shifting a little bit to the automotive interest, industry in particular, and it, it seems like it's in such transition right now with... Uh, I love it. Right? It's with a huge opportunity. Absolutely. Yeah. Electrification and uh, subscription models and new OEMs entering the ecosystem and uh, increasing complexity of the vehicles themselves with the digital components. So much transition. How do you lead that portion of your business with this kind of a marketplace? Partners, people, product. Um, got the best partner in the world with Toyota. Um, they, they have the fortress balance sheet and the wherewithal and the long-term vision to be able to play this multi-pathway strategy that they've been on, whereas the domestics have essentially said we are going to skip straight to BEV. Unfortunately, we have a government that is picking winners and losers and wanting to force a BEV solution. And I'm not opposed to BEV in any way, shape, or form. Um, I just think that, one, the marketplace should determine who wins, and two, it's a naive approach to a very long-term transformation um, that has a host of other viable options. Um, first and foremost, you've got hybrid where <clears throat> much less dependence upon the battery and the um, minerals uh, because the battery is smaller and yet if you can get 50 miles to the gallon you produce much less carbon and carbon is the enemy. It's, we, we're focused on a powertrain and the issue is carbon reduction. And so if you can get 50 miles to the gallon in a clean burning engine, the carbon emission and the footprint of building that vehicle is so much more efficient than the average age of a vehicle on the road today in the US is the oldest it's ever been, it's 12.5 years. So most of those 12.5 year old average vehicles are probably getting about 15 miles to the <coughs> gallon. So just think about the lift that you get by going hybrid. If you then go plug in hybrid, again, a little bigger battery, a little more mineral consumption, but still incredibly efficient. My daughter-in-law is a school teacher with a two year old. Her commute is, I think about 20 miles. The RAV4 Prime that she drives, she plugs in every night, um, is less than, it's got a 45 mile range and she basically uses the battery all the time. I have to remind her, exercise the engine every now and again. Uh, but if she wants to go to Orlando, she's got almost 400 miles of gasoline range on that plug-in hybrid. BEV is clearly going to evolve. We still have a chemistry issue that everybody's trying to solve with density and charging speed and 
mineral consumption and weight and infrastructure and, uh, and, and it will get there and Toyota has been dogmatically saying we believe that solid state will be scalable by 2030 and they're trying to bring that in. If we get to solid state, then you get the density issue, you get the recharge time, uh, you, you, you make huge progress. And they're on a path where they're gonna do that. They're spending $14 billion in North Carolina to manufacture their own batteries here in the US for both plug-ins as well as uh, uh, full battery, uh, battery electric. And they still very much are all in on hydrogen in that multi-pathway approach. They are producing fuel cells that PACAR and Peterbilt will begin to incorporate into, uh, uh, into their over-the-road trucks. Part of the challenge with BEVs is the weight of the batteries. And most people don't consider that. I, I always chuckle when you hear all the press about um, Tesla doing this um, over-the-road <clears throat> truck with, uh, with Pepsi um, because the weight of the battery is heavier than many of the bridges can actually handle. So I, I, I would just submit that I think they're going to haul Frito-Lay <clears throat> on Pepsi itself uh, because if you put load on top of a heavy battery, um, you've, you've got a real, uh, a, a real issue. So I think that multi-pathway, we need to get our infrastructure right. Um, and, it, you know, and think about it, 12 and a half years, the park in the U.S. is actually the same, the park meaning the, the number of vehicles that are in service is essentially one-to-one, -one, which is pretty amazing when you consider all the kids that aren't driving age yet. So, uh, you know, we've, we've got plenty of vehicles. It will take a long period of time and hence that multi-pathway approach that I think uh, Toyota is, uh, uh, is, is professing. And they've got the wherewithal to, to do that. There's also, uh, you know, continuing work being done on um, hydrogen combustion. Um, Akio Toyota is a uh, uh, race car driver when he's not the chairman. If you want to see his eyes light up um, and when he talks about combustible hydrogen, he says it burns so hot and it is so fast that he loves uh, the opportunity there. But that's an infrastructure problem just like battery electric charging is an infrastructure problem. There's only a handful of hydrogen charge, uh, charge stations out there. So, I mean, maybe just related to what's going on in the industry, um, can you say a little bit about where you think dealerships are headed? Because obviously there is some innovation in the model around more direct to consumer, the Tesla model, um, you know, different kinds of ways in which used cars are being sold, like Caravana and things like that. If we look kind of ahead 20 years, what do you think is the role of the dealership in the ecosystem and sure. how is that going to evolve? Well, you will not get fair and balanced here. We are decidedly dealer-centric in everything that we do, and thankfully, Toyota is, uh, is as well. Having said that, I believe, um, I get back to, it's the second biggest purchase that people make. It's one thing for Tesla to, um, to have a model when you look at the demographic of their customer base, uh, and you look at the fact that most of the early adopters that they've had, it was not a primary vehicle. It was a second, third, fourth mm. vehicle uh, in, in the garage. Um, when it's your daily driver, what role does the dealer play? They sell you the vehicle. They trade in, take the trade. They put a value on that vehicle. They provide the financing. They provide the title and registration services to you, uh, and they assist in, the, in obtaining insurance. When you take the dealer out of the mix, it becomes a much more complex uh, version of things. Uh, and so 
We believe that a dealer-centric model where they are very customer-focused um, and uh, uh, meet the customer where they want to be met, so to the Carvana, uh, you know, fully digital side of the equation, um, our dealers need to have an online store and allow their consumers to do as much or as little <clears throat> and respect right. everything that they've done online when they get in. But it's still that second biggest purchase and there's no substitute for a test drive and no substitute for an informed sales associate helping to explain the features and the benefits and the options and where you go uh, as opposed to somebody who may not know all the nuance that's just trying to either configure or pick uh, in, a, in a digital world. So we believe that uh, you know, a great dealer body, our dealers are the highest volume, um, most profitable uh, dealers in the country. Uh, we are going to do everything that we can to support and enhance their ability to deliver that great service. It's, uh, it's difficult to do it in a digital only right. mode. Um, equally true, they can't say, I'm only in a physical world. I, in the 177, we don't have anybody. <clears throat> views their life as being physical only. Yep. It's, a, it's a, a mixed world and, and, and you've got to let people do as much or as little as they want. I will say that during the height of COVID, it drove consumers to that online world very quickly and we're now seeing some of those consumers move back to in-person. Um, it, or doing more of it in person. Just like talent. Yeah, I was just gonna, <laughs> yeah. I was just gonna th say that leads me directly to the question of, you know, sort of talent strategy and workforce trends and in a virtual world, how are you managing that? Yeah, so uh, our associates are our most important resource and, uh, you know, recruiting, retaining the best and the brightest is, uh, is, is foremost. Um, we have 5,000 associates associates, not employees. Um, you know, this was a Jim Moranism. I, he says, I don't have people that work for me, I have people I work with. Um, and that, that shows you, um, you know, what his approach was. And, and, and he always said that the two most important words that you can say are thank you. Um, so, uh, uh, you know, that gets back to that cultural element of things. So we want to recruit and retain the best it's clear that you know giving people the flexibility to be able to uh, to work from home um, when it makes sense. But as we all discussed, uh, you know, I, I started in the consulting world at, at at KPMG. It was then. I think it's less so now, but I think it maybe is is going back. It was an apprenticeship model. Yeah. You, know, you you know, you went to your client, you had that pecking order of leadership that you were learning from and growing from, and I, I, we believe there's no substitute for that. Um, we have a, any number of production-related roles that are impossible to process vehicles, to uh, process parts, to, um, you know, the trucking side of the equation where you're doing the logistics, you, you know, there's, there's no virtual way to do that. But we have plenty of other roles that, uh, that can be, some of which are actually more productive in a, in a virtual environment. But I believe that that culture can only become inculcated by having people be together and the spontaneity and the mentorship and the, um, apprentice nature of so much of the work that we do is augmented by uh, by all of that. I mean, I, you know, we, we talked about this morning, I have a number of uh, teams, skip level meetings that I do each week that are a byproduct of uh, the COVID world. I've retained them, one, it, it they're, it takes away the geographical limitations so I can reach out to a salesperson that is in a different part of the country or to one of our production 
uh, centers that's in uh, uh, another place in the southeast, et cetera. Um, so the geographic side of things is a, is a benefit, um, whether it's Teams or Zoom or whatever the case may be. Actually, the accountability of people, and, and we, you can't hide we, we expect the video to be on so that you can see the reaction that you're getting and the engagement that you get. It, it's, it's a substitute, but it's a poor substitute for, for doing it together. And so even in those um, knowledge worker roles that could in theory be done virtually, we have all hands days at least one or two days a week. And uh, even our technology folks, um, they find an immense benefit in having those teams um, be physically located together. Um, you know, which is not to say, I had a call, we have a machine learning data scientist that started with us here and she moved for family reasons and uh, she lives in Denver and she was on one of the calls. <clears throat> It's not like we have an office in Denver, uh, but she does come back to connect with her team and, uh, and, and whatnot. So it, there's gives and takes, and, uh, um, but no substitute for, um, for in-person. And we have, a, as I was mentioning, we've got an awesome campus that is really conducive to um, collaboration. So just maybe switching a little bit, Brent, to the industry. There's kind of a dizzying array of things going on. You've got, um, as you said, a lot of government involvement in, you know, sort of almost industry policy for the car industry related to, you know, powertrains and that kind of thing. You've got, I think, the increasing conversation about the U.S. manufacturing base and the role of the car industry in that. And there's been much more regionalization of supply chains globally. You've got different business models, ride share, all of that. There's lots of innovation around the product, autonomous vehicles, and so on. So as you kind of maybe just look ahead, what, do you, what is your outlook or view of where the car industry is going over the next decade or two? Um, if you had asked me in 2018, um, you know, the industry prognosticators would have said, uh, you know, the most transformational force uh, was going to be autonomy. Um, and um, that has proven to be a more vexing mm -hmm. challenge than anybody uh, anticipated. Uh, I'm not suggesting that I don't think we won't have uh, autonomy um, in the future, but it is, it's had a really bad year this mm -hmm. year. The cruise accident just showed the risk um, inherent in it. And um, as much as AI is, uh, has the potential to um, help, um, there are it's so complex. So I'll, I'll, I'll give you an example. I am blessed to have about a seven mile commute up A1A. Mm -hmm. There, are, I need to count it. I, I'm not, I, there's probably 15 crosswalks on that. Some of them are the more modern ones where you push the button and the lights tell everybody that the person's crossing. But they all, state law says you must stop and give right of way to, to, the, uh, to the pedestrian. There's a moment in every encounter that I have as a driver that I don't know how an algorithm will ever catch that of I'm looking at you as the pedestrian, you're looking at me, and we agree I'm going to stop. And my agreement it's a, it's a negotiation. <laughs> is conditional upon making sure that the person behind me 
is going to be able to stop and not hit me and knock me into you as you're crossing the road. I'm a huge technology believer. I'm not sure how that use case effectively gets solved. Um, mm -hmm. and, um, and that's the challenge in an urban environment. Now, having said that, ADAS, or Advanced Driver Assistance Systems, are already at the point where if I'm not stopping and you're walking out, my car will stop itself because the sonar and the, um, the technology that is in it. And that technology will continue to, to grow and evolve. And, you know, this is one where, you know, the wisdom of Toyota is, you know, first Akio, the race driver, is like, who wouldn't want to drive? So he, he's not a huge, let's hand it to the machine, because he, he thinks that uh, even though they're on a path to, to be able to do that, but they've said ADAS is not optional. So we're going to put all of our advanced driver assistance systems in every vehicle that we've got in the lineup. Um, and each succeeding model, I, we're on version 3. Dot something uh, of ADAS. And, um, and so we can have a much safer roadway. Um, back to your broader point, um, powertrain is going to matter. Um, you know, having spent a decade in the car rental business when Hertz made the front page with their partnership with Tesla, I had to scratch my head because, uh, you know, range anxiety is a real thing when you are a local driver and you know where everything is. If you are either a commercial driver in a city that you're, is not home or a tourist much worse. Uh, I scratched my head and said, how's that going to work? And I think they've had the bruising realization that that's the case. And we see it in our dealer lots today. Um, the industry is running about a 45 or 50 day supply of vehicles. Um, the BEV day supply is closer to 100. So the consumer is only partially ready uh, for battery electric. Um, Although there was probably some overproduction on the part of the OEMs. For sure. Yeah. No, no question about that. Um, and it's all premium products, so there's mm -hmm. not a low-end right. um, battery electric solution that's out there, which I come back to plug-in and hybrid <clears throat> is a logical way for us to proceed. I really believe that in the long run, hydrogen will wind up being the heavy duty trucking and over the road solution. Um, so it's, you know, it's an exciting time to, to be in, uh, in the industry um, and um, you know, watching as, uh, as these technological forces, whether it be powertrain or uh, autonomy slash ADAS, um, and then the different business models that those beget uh, creates uh, a real opportunity. But I ultimately come back to, you know, partners, great manufacturer in Toyota, the best dealers in the business, and great people that's a competitive differentiator that is, is going to be the difference maker. Well, it won't come as any surprise then that JM Family is one of those organizations that's really committed to strengthening the communities in which the, you operate, in which your uh, associates live and work. Uh, and you're personally pretty involved in Broward County. Uh, I have a list of, of things that you've done. Uh, you're, you sit on the board of the Boys and Girls Club in Broward. You're a lifetime board member for Kids in Distress and you've served as co-chair of the Habitat for Humanity of Broward CEO Builds. Tell me about this. I mean, this, you've talked a, bit, a little bit about culture. Maybe we didn't have enough time to really talk about how that operates inside, but you're making a statement. Yeah. 
I'll back it up and say that it, it kind of connects to this business model that Jim Moran uh, had, had this vision for, which is start at the customer, don't just meet the customer's expectations, but actually exceed the customer's expectations. Build your business model to successfully deliver on that first part. And that business model includes allowing your most important resource, your associates, to participate in the success that you generate um, and allows the Moran family to benefit from the success of that business. But then we have to be a great citizen and we have to give back to the communities that we live and work in. Um, and we do that through the Jim Moran Foundation. We do that through our corporate philanthropy. We don't like to have our associates just give to a United Way campaign. And I'm proud to say that we had an all-time high penetration this year. I think 68% of our associates contributed to United Way. Mm. Um, and um, But we always focus on um, you can give your treasure, but it's really more impactful if you'll give your time and your talent, too. So. You know, you go to Feeding South Florida, where we are a huge supplier there. They will tell you that our process engineers have come in and allowed them to increase their throughput almost 400% since oh. we began, began um, uh, being involved with them. Um, and, um, and so get back to, give back to those communities that you live and work in. It serves two purposes. One you're building a stronger employment base for you to draw upon, but you're also giving back to that community which creates those great customers that was the place that we started it all at. So it's a, you know, it's a very uh, purposeful um, uh, circle uh, that, um, that really works well. Um, we're proud uh, not just of what we give, but the boards that our associates serve on, how involved we can be. Um, we, uh, for anybody that's a corporate leader out there, I will tell you, I don't know that there's a better team building exercise than a Habitat for Humanity um, house. Um, you see work ethic, you see teamwork, you see engagement and you gain an appreciation and as we talked about earlier today, workforce housing is an incredibly huge challenge and issue for all of South Florida. And um, so we were building our latest four houses, which takes us to 47 uh, that we've done in the last 20 years. And um, they had 35,000 applicants and 500 opportunities last year. Um, so the need is, uh, is incredible and um, there's a, Channel 7 did a, a story, one of the homeowners that we're building for is a single dad, which is a unique thing in and of itself. A bona fide hero. He works, he lives in Broward, but he works in Dade County and he teaches the Transit Authority bus drivers. Um, this guy, three years ago, saw a car run into a canal and pulled over, hopped in, and pulled the family out of the sinking car. Um, but having said that, he was living with other family members and his children didn't have bedrooms and, uh, and, and so this is going to transform. What also made it incredibly impactful was one of our associates who participated in that build was a Habitat child in a home that we built in that prior 20 years. The other thing that was really cool was there was a Habitat associate that's just joined Broward. Um, not only is he a Habitat child himself, bona fide hero, a West Point grad, um, and uh, a, a real athlete uh, on top of it who, when he left the service, said, 
I have to give back to this organization that gave me a pathway to that level of success. So, uh, you know, it's one thing if you're just writing a check, but when you get involved and you learn those stories, you can get really passionate. And I could go, I could wax on about Boys and Girls Club and the fact that in Broward County, the graduation rate in public uh, schools is less than 50%, but Boys and Girls Club um, members have a 97% graduation rate. Um, so talk about making a difference and providing a safe environment and teaching them life skills and how to be a good citizen. And so, um, and uh, you know, if you want stories that will really tug at your heartstrings, Kids in Distress has got those stories in, uh, uh, you know, so many different uh, different places. But um, it's 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 one thing to uh, just make a contribution. It's just so much, I think, more impactful if we can get our associates bought into how, you know, whether it's toy drives or, uh, you know, um, painting a boys and girls club or something where they get personally engaged uh, in making our community a better place. Your culture's working. It is. It is. We had a lot more questions which we didn't get through. But I want to make sure that we have a chance to ask if anyone in the audience has any questions. Maybe we'll take two questions, maybe one in the back and then one over here. Push it, push it. Yeah, so uh, great question. Uh, and for those of you that, that couldn't hear, it was, you know, what's our philosophy and approach to integration? And um, um, we try not to be so prideful that we um, say you've got to do it our way. Uh, we, we hope that we're learning and growing from everybody that we, we acquire, but we also think that we can give them access to talent and uh, um, strategy and uh, ap approaches that um, they might not otherwise uh, get. And, and certainly if you look at our um, control investments in these diversified businesses, you know, they're subscale to everything that we do. So we bring an immense amount, of, you know, of value without actually going in, you know, lift and shift to the cloud. We've, you know, our IT team can give them world-class approach to, to how they're going to, how they're going to take it there. Our center of excellence, you know, gives them the opportunity to, um, to figure out how artificial intelligence might be applied. But undergirding all of that is our culture. And uh, you know, it, was, it was interesting because we have the JM Family Way, which is, is really our, how we've kind of codified what our culture is all about. And it gets back to that two-pronged approach where it's the what and the how side of the equation. We were so balanced internally on the how side of things because most of us grew up in the core auto businesses where the, um, the execution and the disciplines and everything were incredibly mature and they were just kind of innately um, understood. But we realized with these acquisitions that they would look at it and it's like, you have this cascading um, series of um, uh, objectives and um, tied into performance metrics, into pay plans, and, uh, and, and uh, a, a discipline and a structure. And so it forced us to go back and say, all right, the um, how is important, but the what and how we go about doing it needs to be flushed out more. And so we've really flushed that out more. And so perfect example of as a new hire coming in, you don't have to 
think and deal with things through osmosis. We've tried to codify things mm. and, um, and help them get up that learning curve really quickly on both the what and the how side of, of, of what we're doing. Great, and the, over here. Hi, Brent. Uh, I'm actually, my name's Justin Garman. I'm actually an intern at JM Family Enterprises. I work in the enterprise strategy team and also a master's student at UM. So did I get it right or not? You did, you did. <laughs> <laughs> um, my question is what advice, you talked a lot about culture, what advice would you give to a young professional who's looking to contribute to that type of culture you mentioned? Yeah, I, you know, it's, it, it, it's funny. We, we often say that um, your career is a lattice, not a ladder, um, and I'm a perfect example of that. I always say, you know, I can't keep a job because I've, I've bounced around and I've done a lot of things, but I, I sit there and I look at the different roles that I've had. So, you know, when I was on the consulting side of things, it's all about the customer, but it's also all about having a great team. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you, you know, it's funny, my um, son was in the consulting business for a while and he's like, well, how do you make sure you got the best people and, you, you know, do you look at their um, reviews or what do you do and 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 I, and I told them I said well if you really want to cut through it look at their chargeability because the people that are good are always in demand and they're never really available that will tell you I'm sure you have yeah. the same same issue there but um, it, you know so it's it's you know being able to um, uh, look at that uh, um, uh, that approach to it and it's it just um, it's not managing a career progression. It's how do I deliver and add as much value as I possibly can? How can I be a selfless servant leader that is building <coughs> relationships and teams? I, you know, I always laugh and say, I only applied for one job in my life and that was, um, when I graduated from FAU, picking uh, the uh, you know the consulting firm that I was going to go to, I have so much fun with PwC because at that time it was the Big Eight, and they were one of the only two that didn't provide me with an offer. Um, so I, t I tell them I don't hold that against them, um, but um, <clears throat> you know. So and then the thing that I. I you know, I, I say this to my children all the time is make sure that your body of work is always something that you're going to be proud of, not just today, but five years from now, 10 years from now. And, you know, um, and, and make sure that you're associated. And I'd like to believe that we are, uh, you know, an employer of choice and a destination that allows us to recruit um, more successfully, you know, our, the internship program that you are participating in, I think we had 70 or 75 last year. I think we had, it was like 15,000 applications for those 75 roles. Um, so, our, you know, <laughs> we, we cast the net pretty, pretty wide. And so, um, you know, there's there's a lot that's that's bundled up in that, um, but you should always um, be able to look back with no regrets and feel like I, I can be proud of, of what I've done and uh, the people that I've been associated with. And I've never had to find another job after that one because it was always a relationship mm. and, you know, it was my client saying for five and a half years, when are you going to come to work for us? It was um, the relationships that I built at JM Family that led to both Otter Nation and then ultimately to, uh, uh, to, to JM Family itself. I think that's probably a good moment to stop for this morning. One thing, Brent, thank you for coming. I'll just sort of say to everyone, my reflection on that is you can see the values throughout this entire discussion that you built your career on the listening, the focus on other people's success and the humility and it's really a, a privilege to have had you come here and share your thoughts. So thank you very much for that. Thank you very much. My daughter's a UM grad by the way.